Hello from the heartland. My name is Jenna, and this is Smarter News. News when it matters and why it matters. Our Smarter series features unique people who help us think and live smarter. Well, today we're back with Gordon Chang. He is an analyst, book author, writer, commentator. He has written for just about everybody from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal. He has spoken all over the world from Shanghai to London. He has also really had long discussions with high-ranking government officials like those in the State Department or the CIA or in Congress. So Gordon has been everywhere, talked to everyone. And one of my favorite things about him, because he is one of my favorite guests, I have to say, Gordon, I'm just going to confess it from the top. You're one of my favorite guests to talk to about all things foreign policy related, but you have a specific expertise in China, which is where we're going to focus today. So I say return guests because we actually spoke last year at almost the same time, which just sort of worked out. I had reached out to you a couple of weeks ago as we saw the developments in Eastern Europe, but also have seen this role related to China. And we've been kind of working out how to, how to, how to kind of position this interview, but just to launch right into things, I want to read you something. So this is the very first answer to our first question in our first interview for Smarter News, Gordon, in April of 2021. And this is what you said. What we're seeing right now, Jenna, is two big aggressors, Russia and China, are threatening neighbors. You have Russia uh, pressuring Ukraine. They've got more than 85,000 troops that they've just brought to the border of uh, former Soviet Republic, now an independent state. And they're moving in high performance aircraft. And at the same time, we have China um, going after Taiwan. There are almost daily flights through the Taiwan's air defense identification zone. That's international airspace, but it is considered to be provocative to fly through someone's ADIS um, without actually talking to them beforehand. And that's what China is doing. You, you have Moscow and Beijing thinking that they can move against countries in their regions. And that's why you've got two very um, volatile situations occurring at the same time. And you have a United States that is not really prepared to deal with both crises at the same time. And so you were responding to a question that I asked about one of your tweets at the time. And you tweeted this out, the elements of history's next great conflict are all in place. The only thing missing is the spark. Do we get the spark, Gordon? I guess we've already had the spark, Jenna, in the sense that uh, Russia has now moved into Ukraine in full force. And I know the, the heroism of the Ukrainian people have stopped them. Um, but Russia, if it wants to, can actually employ its most destructive weapons, its nuclear and, and chemical weapons. Um, I hope that Biden will be able to deter them. But, uh, you know, we saw a massive failure of deterrence, perhaps, well, certainly the worst in our lifetimes, maybe the worst in, in American history, because we had uh, the United States, 27 nations of the European Union and Great Britain, Combined, these countries have an economy greater than 25 times the size of Russia's. We can see the worst happening, and it's not just Eastern Europe, as we've been talking about. It could be East Asia as well. Well, let's just talk about that for a second, because in April of last year, you were giving the Biden administration a little bit of room. You said they just came into office. They're developing their policy. World leaders sort of know this, or they're testing. They're testing the new administration. So when you say that the Biden administration and others, you mentioned the EU as well, have failed in deterrence, what have they specifically failed at? Biden warned uh, Russia not to invade Ukraine. And uh, Russia just ignored that. Um, and we've seen since then war crimes. We've seen this um, targeting of civilians, um, all these things that uh, the world abhors. And uh, Putin seems to continue on. The only thing that is stopping him is uh, some very brave people in Ukraine um, who have surprised not only Putin, but of course the world. And, you know, Putin has made it very clear that it's more than just Ukraine he wants. He wants not only to reconstitute the Soviet Union, it looks like he wants to reconstitute the Russian empire. And we don't even know if he's going to stop there. Um, right now, he's, of course, got problems in Ukraine. But uh, if he gets past them, then we can assume that uh, he's got grander ambitions. And, and we know that as uh, Putin wants to annex his neighbors, 
uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, he wants to annex the world. So this is, this is a problem that we're going to have to deal with for quite some time until the Biden administration, until the West shows that it can deal effectively with aggressors, then I think we've got a world of hurt. Well, and I know from our past conversations and we've spoken for with, with each other, I've done interviews together for more than a decade now, Gordon, when I think about it, which just seems like a really long time. Um, I know that you're an equal opportunist critic, <laughs> Republican, Democrats alike. You've really taken issue with American leadership in general when it comes to Russia and specifically China. And because it served us so well last time, using one of your tweets to get into the conversation, I want to use one that you just put out just over the last couple of days. You said the quickest way to get Russia out of Ukraine is sanction China. Why? Why China? Because China is financing the war. Um, on February 4th, when uh, Putin and Xi Jinping announced their No Limits partnership in that 5,000-word communique, um, they announced uh, $117.5 billion in new oil and gas deals. Um, since that time, uh, Russia has announced that China is going to buy 100 million metric tons of coal. China has removed restrictions on the importation of Russian wheat. So this is uh, China financing this war. Um, with these elevated commodity purchases. And, and then China, of course, has been helping other ways with making its financial system available to Russian institutions that have been sanctioned. Um, China's put its diplomats in service of the Kremlin. And uh, it, what's important from China's point of view, they put their propaganda machines, their central government and their Communist Party propaganda machines, amplifying these ludicrous Russian narratives. So China is all in. And China thinks that it can support Russia with impunity. Um, without this money, you know, no more money, no more war. Um, and the money is coming from China these days. Why does China want to get involved with what Russia is doing in Eastern Europe? Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping see the world in the same terms. And they identify the same enemy, which is us. And Xi Jinping believes that even though Russia may be failing at it, he is diverting our attention and also he's bleeding us. Um, so uh, this is something that Xi Jinping believes is important. Um, even if Vladimir Putin goes down the drain, Xi Jinping believes that he will have accomplished important objectives. And so um, there is this strong partnership. We may think that, that Xi Jinping shouldn't calculate his interests this way. I certainly don't think he should, but the fact is he does. And at least in the here and now, uh, Russia and China have this very important partnership where China is supporting these the, these Russian initiatives into Ukraine and everywhere else for that matter. Because Putin has made it clear he's going after not only Ukraine, but also the Scandinavian countries, the Baltic countries, Poland. This is something that we have to understand. He won't stop until we stop him. What does that look like then, considering China in the equation? That looks like uh, this partnership of China and Russia taking on the world. You know, the world is cleaving. You know, people have said, you know, new world order. Um, President Biden actually said that. And the new world order must mean um, that the world is no longer um, peaceful. It is dividing into two camps like the Cold War. And on one side, you've got China and Russia at the core of a coalition, which also involves North Korea, Pakistan, Iran probably Algeria as well. And on the other side, you have uh, the Western democracies and their friends around the world. You've got Japan, you've got South Korea and other countries. Um, so this is uh, what people don't want. But you know, just because we don't want it doesn't mean we shouldn't be uh, protecting ourselves. And unfortunately, American policymakers, and this is both Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, have um, shied away from recognizing what was happening. This Russia-China partnership was obvious to so many, and yet we had really smart people in Washington say, oh, we don't have to worry about it because China and Russia have interests that collide. And yes, they do, but I'm not worried about what happens a century from now. I'm worried about what's occurring now, and we're, what's occurring now is China and Russia are working very closely together. So what do we do? First of all, I think that we have to understand that this challenge against us is existential. Um, China is not just a competitor. 
Uh, you know, Biden um, uh, talks about China being a competitor. He won't use the term adversary. He certainly won't use the term enemy. But the Chinese have no such reluctance. In May 2019, People's Daily, which is the most authoritative publication in China, actually carried a piece that declared a quote unquote people's war on us. Um, and we have seen the hostile propaganda continue um, to this present time. So um, we have to understand that China wants to destroy our country. I know that most people think that that's extreme, but during 2020, for instance, we had uh, China both openly and surreptitiously advocate the violent overthrow of the US government. And you know the Trump administration did not want to take China on then, um, but uh, regardless of it, we're just not defending ourselves. And the thing that really distresses me is that we have, we're a far stronger country than China. We're a far stronger country than Russia. We're far stronger than a combination of China and Russia together, but they can take us down because we're not defending ourselves. They're attacking us, we're not defending. Republicans, Democrats, liberals, and conservatives, the American people should be outraged at the failure of our political class to protect the United States of America. Talk to me about what you, you mentioned China surreptitiously, if I can pronounce that correctly, <laughs> going into interrupting the 2020 elections. We've heard a lot about Russia interference. What was China doing? China was through um, social media platforms, through text messages, spreading disinformation. And this was a massive effort. Uh, so for instance, Twitter, and I think this was July, 2020, took down something like 174,000 fake Chinese accounts. Um, and this was just a massive effort. Um, and um, the Radio Free Asia reports that an intelligence unit of the People's Liberation Army, China's military, actually based themselves in the now closed Houston consulate of China. And there they were using big data and artificial intelligence to identify Americans likely to participate in violent protests, specifically Antiva and Black Lives Matter protests. And then they were sending them videos via TikTok on how to riot. That is advocating the violent overthrow of the US government. But it was not just surreptitious activities. So for instance, we had Chen Wei Hua, who is the European Bureau Chief of China Daily, which is an official Communist Party publication, on October 18th of 2020, actually issued a tweet which um, promoted uh, the throwing of petrol bombs on American streets. That's violent overthrow of the US government. And the US government didn't do anything. Um, the Trump administration should have immediately moved against China Daily, but it didn't. So, you know, here we have uh, China attacking us. And, and this, is, this is not just um, what we talk about now. It's also uh, China spreading COVID-19, um, China being behind the fentanyl gangs. We're talking about the deaths of more than a million Americans. So what changes the dynamic, Gordon? Let's say tomorrow you're able to walk into the White House and you're able to instantly make three changes. What, what at the top of your head, what are the three changes we need to make to appropriately confront China and to de-escalate the situation that we're in right now? Well, I'm not sure that I would de-escalate it um, because well, we're I guess at a what I'm saying level. is, is yeah. if if we're if we're towards this ongoing conflict and we could be headed towards this period of war, that's what. And you're right, de-escalate can be used in a very political way too, which is it's not the way I want to use it. I just want I want everyone to be safe. So, right. and what you're saying is that the behavior of the American government is actually making Americans more vulnerable. So, how do we make ourselves safer? What actions do we actually need to take? Okay. Well, first, this is going to be drastic. Um, but I'll explain later. First of all, um, we cut most trade with China um, and we encourage manufacturing in the US. That's a complicated set of policy recommendations, but that's the first thing. Second, um, it is no longer, I would prohibit investment into China's markets and I prohibit almost all Chinese investment into the US. Um, second, third thing I would do is cut technical cooperation agreements. It would no longer be possible for, let's say, Johns Hopkins to co cooperate with Chinese medical institutions. And by the way, if I have a fourth recommendation, I'd be closing the remaining four Chinese consulates and I'd be stripping the embassy staff in Washington down to the bare essentials, just the Chinese ambassador, his family and personal staff. 
everybody else, the thousands would have to leave. Why do you believe that those actions would actually lead to a more, I don't want to say stability or be more beneficial to the American public than actually harm the American public? Well, there's going to be harm to the American public, but you know, we could not conduct three decades of truly misguided China policy and not expect uh, to be um, to suffer some risk and some harm um, because we got to get ourselves out of it. China exploits every point of contact with the United States to undermine our society, overthrow our government. Um, China takes the position uh, it, that um, it, it is the world's only sovereign state, which means that in its our its view that we're only a colony. Um, this me and, and and I know that sounds ludicrous, but that's what the Chinese in fact are saying. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that because it's even more ludicrous than what I just mentioned. But the point is China uses every point of contact to undermine us, which means that we're being overwhelmed. Our FBI is overwhelmed, local law enforcement's overwhelmed, governments are overwhelmed, um, businesses, universities are overwhelmed. And until we eliminate those points of contact and feel that we can maintain you know, some contact and still be safe, until we get to that point where we feel comfortable, then we've got to do this or we can lose our country. So one so, of the things, when you were talking about Ukraine and, and what's going on with Russia and the bleeding of America, that's also what you're talking about, isn't it, Gordon? The bleeding of energy, just energy in general, resources, time as a huge distraction. And that's something that China is is invested in. It seems like what you're saying, not only in places like Eastern Europe, but also just fomenting that sort of discord here at home and investing in that to get to this place of feeling overwhelmed on many levels and making us less effective, less efficient. And, and, and less able to deal with the China challenge. So, um, you know, this is, this is unfortunate. Um, you know, for instance, my dad came here as a student um, with, on a Chinese government scholarship. This is the previous government, the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek, not the communist government. But, you know, we have a lot of students in our country from China. And estimates are that 13 percent of them were committing espionage at the direction of the Communist Party. And, you know, I, so I, I feel that this is a very emotional issue for me. But the point is, we can't allow this espionage to continue. Um, we've allowed in our country um, the Chinese diplomats and even Ministry of State Security agents to monitor Chinese students on our campuses. Um, we just can't permit this anymore because the loss to the United States is too great. Um, and yes, um, removing Chinese students and doing some other things will result in us being less prosperous. Um, but I don't believe we have a choice on this. Um, largely because the damage that China is doing to the United States. So just taking this issue of espionage, um, there are various estimates of the annual loss to the United States through China's criminal theft of our intellectual property. But you know, at the low end, at the very low end, you're talking $150 billion a year. At the top end, you're talking $600 billion a year. This is a mortal wound in our economy and our future, and we just got to stop it. How likely do you think that China makes a move on Taiwan? And what would that move look like if they did? Well, you know, despite what many people say, or some people say, I don't think a problem this year in terms of an invasion. And the reason is the 20th National Congress. We know that the leaders are fighting among themselves. In order to be a, um, in order to have an invasion, they've got to agree. Um, even with Xi Jinping being paramount leader, they still have to have some level of consensus to do this. And that's not going to happen this year. Um, and it's probably not going to happen even next year. Um, this is one of the most interesting topics. Um, just a couple things that people don't talk about, um, which do point towards stability. And that is that in order for China to launch an invasion of Taiwan, Xi Jinping has to give some general or admiral almost complete control over the Chinese military. And that makes that figure the most powerful person in China. And Xi Jinping, especially in a leadership crisis, is not about to do that. The other thing is that China right now is very casualty averse. And obviously, an attack on Taiwan would involve massive Chinese casualties, which for various reasons would be extremely unpopular in China right now. So those two things point to stability, but there are a number of things that point to instability, including China seeing a closing window of opportunity, 
especially with the deglobalization that is accelerated by the Ukraine crisis. It makes China less important. Um, and if China is less important, it can't intimidate, it becomes less powerful. I think that Chinese leaders are seeing that they've got to move sometime soon. And this is in accordance with uh, Xi Jinping's rhetoric on taking over Taiwan. So, um, there, you know, you have factors pointing both ways, but I think on balance, uh, Taiwan is more at risk now than it was, for instance, three or four months ago. One of the big stories this week is about China doing these rolling shutdowns in Shanghai, a place that that you worked in the past, that you know, you're very familiar with this large city. What is the factor of the coronavirus pandemic in any of China's calculations? Well, right now, the, um, the, the epidemic in China is certainly undermining the Chinese economy, and it's making the Chinese people not very happy. I mean, we uh, have hints of these large um, but isolated protests, uh, people just being sick and fed up of being locked down in really? various Chinese I haven't Chinese seen cities. anything about that. I, uh, where, where has that happened? <laughs> There have been a couple of them, um, one in southern China that has gotten a little bit more attention, but one also in central China. Um, the people just are really fed up with this. As you can imagine, Americans are fed up with it. But in China, the lockdowns are more severe um, and the government is far more strict because um, China doesn't have an effective vaccine against coronavirus. So what it's doing is it's it's contact tracing, it is massive testing and isolation. And that's their only defenses against these diseases. And that makes that is incredibly disruptive. So for instance, you mentioned Shanghai. Shanghai up to now has had rolling lockdowns where you know neighborhoods would be affected. But what they're doing now is locking down the entire city in two parts. First the eastern part of the city and then the western part of the city, both for four days a piece or five days a piece in one case. Um, and um, this, is, um, this is going to affect the people because first of all, you can't go, to, no public transportation, you can't go to work. I mean, if you're gonna work, you're gonna have to do it remotely from home. You're gonna be tested uh, again and again. So um, this is incredibly um, unpopular in China these days. So the picture that you're painting of China right now is one that has a lot of strategy against the United States and basically dethroning the United States as a, as a world power, but also there being a lot of internal turmoil politically with the epidemic as well. There's pressure on this current government. Then you put into all of this North Korea, another topic that I know that you, you have studied extensively. And just over the last week or so, North Korea launches this long range missile, that the, the most advanced that we've seen, the most successful launch that we've seen in recent years. How is this all, con can you connect the dots to this, Gordon? How is this connected? Yeah, um, uh, North Korea launched the Wasong, what we think is the Wasong 17, um, which has a range of 9,300 miles. Um, it, it, the test didn't go 9,300 miles downrange, but it went up very high and lasted a long time. And if you just sort of change the parabola, um, it means basically um, the Wasong 17 can reach any part of the US. We know that they have uh, nuclear weapons. We have a pretty good idea that they've been able to miniaturize them. We don't know if they've been able to mate them, the warhead to the missile, but they're making steady progress. And by the way, if they were gonna attack the US, not with landing a warhead on New York or Austin, for instance, um, they could use an electro electromagnetic pulse attack where all they have to do is explode a, a nuclear device high above the US and they could take out large portions of our grid and according to some estimates, kill a lot of Americans. Um, so they've got this capability. They've been able to develop it even during the moratorium that uh, Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader announced during the Trump administration. Um, the Trump administration tried a new approach with North Korea, which I think was not so much to take away its weapons, but to take North Korea away from China. Um, the Trump administration didn't say that that was what they're doing, but when you look at what they did, it was consistent with that explanation and not with the explanation that they were trying to quote unquote,
denuclearize the North. So of course, during the moratorium, um, everyone forgot about North Korea and they just continued to improve their missiles and their warheads. They didn't test, but they didn't have to. Uh, matter of fact, that what they were doing was taking all their test data from their 2017 tests and, and improving their devices. And we were not paying attention. Um, we were not imposing sanctions on China for violating North Korea sanctions. And so the North Koreans were getting pretty much what they needed. Remember, Jenna, this year they tested a hypersonic glide vehicle, which is one of the most sophisticated weapons in the world. The least likely explanation is that the North Koreans developed this on their own. The North Korean HGV, as it's called, looks exactly like the Chinese vehicle. So clearly they've been getting help from Beijing, maybe from Moscow, but we're not paying attention. We're not uh, going after Moscow or Beijing. So I'm imagining a spider web. And you know with a spider web, if you take away one of the threads, like the whole thing falls apart. And the picture that you're painting is that if we take away that thread of China to North Korea and China to Russia and probably a lot of other places too, you can mention Gordon, that the, the web sort of falls, it collapses on itself. Do, do I have that right? That is China really key to all of this? Yeah, you should be Secretary of State. Yeah, um, <laughs> my next big because, role. <laughs> because, um, you no, know, you're absolutely right about that. Because we have seen in the past when things fall apart, they fall apart a lot of places. But also we have seen that when we're able to establish deterrence, when we're able to punish aggressors, peace happens and it breaks out all over the world at the same time. And that's not a coincidence because these bad guys take their cues from each other. And that really means that, um, you know, once you, as you say, um, to take your analogy is to take away one string of the web, the whole thing will collapse. And that's absolutely right. We deal effectively with Putin um, by, for instance, removing him from power, um, which we probably can do, um, but which, you know, Biden obviously wants to do it, uh, as he said on Saturday, but uh, his administration has walked back that comment. But if we were to do that, then Xi Jinping would sit up and take notice and say, oh, those Americans are serious. Kim Jong-un would take advantage, uh, would take, would notice that. And, and so would the leaders in Iran and Pakistan. Um, this is something that we could, um, I think, end up um, making a peaceful world uh, at a time when things look pretty dark. But you're touching on something. First of all, it's great to entertain that idea because everything does seem pretty dark. So it's, it's good to know that maybe there's a potential to have the pendulum swing the other direction. But because you've, you've, you've pinpointed an issue with American leadership that you say is across party lines, then is the problem really how we see the world or is the problem really how we see America and America's role in it? Uh, both. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, we have this notion, um, which what came since um, the failure of the Soviet Union, the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama famously said. And so we tried to enforce peace. We thought, oh, look, you know, um, it didn't really matter that Russia had a hardline government and that China is moving back to totalitarianism because um, that's the end of history. The end of history was that every country ends up with a liberal democracy and free market economics. Um, but that's not the case. We have to understand that we've got enemies. Those enemies mean us harm and that uh, we're in an existential fight. Um, and until we recognize that, until we go back to the way we viewed the world in earlier times, we're not gonna be able to defend ourselves. And unfortunately, you have a president right now um, and a secretary of state who view the world in fundamentally incorrect terms. I was a little bit heartened when Biden said there's gonna be a new world order um, because essentially, yes, the world is changing. But then he immediately made me pessimistic when he said, well, we're gonna lead it. Well, if there's going to be a new world order, it's going to be the world divided. Um, and it means that we can lead maybe one part of that new world order. But I don't think Biden really understands the implications of what he said. This is going to be a long term, perhaps decades long struggle with Russia, China and their proxies. Let's go back to that one thing that you can say. You can speak to all lawmakers. You can get them all in the same room at the same time. Gordon, what's your message to them about why it's worth it? 
why it's worth it to confront China on these issues now? Because China wants to destroy our society. Um, and uh, this is, there, there's Beijing, um, and it has really nothing to do with the United States, its policy towards China, because our policy has been very beneficial to Beijing, and intentionally so. Um, but China looks at the United States and realizes that we have an inspirational impact on the Chinese people. And the Communist Party is insecure at the best of times um, and is more so now. So they view that they cannot survive um, unless they destroy the United States. And that means um, we have to understand that even though we don't want to think about it in those terms, this is only going to be one survive, survivor. It's going to be the Communist Party of China, or it's going to be the United States of America. We may not want to think that that is the way life is, but unfortunately it is. Remember, Vladimir Putin, despite everything, and you know, invaded uh, Ukraine, everyone was saying, oh, no, he doesn't want to do that. They took all of our policymakers by surprise. Uh, even at the late date of early February, they still didn't think that this was going to happen. So the world is very different from what our policymakers think. They have fundamentally misconceived the world. There is evil in the world, if I may use that term. And we've got to confront it. Because if, if we don't confront it, um, we're going to lose our country. Wow. The stakes are so high. Um, and I've talked about it. We talked about it at the beginning that you have the courage to say things that people are, are afraid to say because they don't want to insult or push away the audience. But I think that we do need to drive into the middle of the intersection of these conversations and sit there for a little bit because we got to consider. We have to we have to put all things on the table to consider. I stumbled upon something. I just want to finish up here, Gordon. You know, you learn something new about someone that you talk to every time you talk to them. And I was looking up something on you the other night, and I stumbled upon an article that you wrote on September 11th, uh, 2011. So it was the 10 year anniversary of September 11th. It was for Forbes. Uh, dot com. And it was the night my wife became an American. And it was just a short little piece. Um, but it was so impactful. And I was wondering if you could talk to our audience about it, because even then you were actually in Chicago, discussing China's support for terrorism on September 11, 2001. But you said that the trip back home was one that left you both impacted you and your wonderful wife, Lydia. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, this is, uh, out of everything I've written, this is the piece I'm most proud of, and it's, it's one of the shortest. Um, you know, on 9-11, on, on we were in Chicago, and uh, we actually, I, I spoke on the 10th, and we were scheduled to fly out of Chicago on the afternoon of the 11th, um, and obviously we couldn't, but on the following day, we got a car um, at O'Hare. And so we started to drive back. It's a 14 hour uh, trip. And we were in Western Pennsylvania. Um, I guess it was around midnight or so. And I, I can't really talk about it. Um, uh, uh, about five or six um, emergency vehicles from Chicago. <laughs> were passing us and they had American flags on it. And my wife looked at it and she was like, she had just become a citizen. And she, she realized for the first time what it meant to be in America. And that will always stay with me and her. It was so, be I can't, I'm tearing up. I'm sorry, Gordon, me too. I didn't know that. I didn't know that you felt this way about this piece, but it, when I stumbled upon it, it, it hit me so hard. I'll put it for our audience to read too, because I think it's moments like this where you are reminded about what's at stake. And the reason why I wanted to mention it is because you speak so passionately about these issues, but it's not from a place of hate. It's because you love the United States and that's why you're feeling this way. Do I have that right? Yeah. 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 So I wanted to leave everyone with that. I don't mean to make you emotional, Gordon. I apologize. No, no, all no. the year, all the years we've talked, I've never made you cry. At least I, I haven't known that I had. Maybe I did. No, this is the first. <laughs> it's the first for every. Look at us, eleven years in, Gordon, and we're crying together. That's all it took, you know. Is like. 
<laughs> took 11 years in talking about all sorts of really serious topics. But this is, again, it's a really beautiful piece. And it's a reminder of that feeling that we get about our country when we feel compelled, compelled to stand for it. And we're really being asked to think about that in all sorts of ways, from the pandemic to foreign policy, what does liberty mean? What does America stand for? These are ongoing themes I know throughout the time of America's creation, but we are being called to really confront it. And that's why I don't want to shy away from these conversations because I think we're being called for a reason. I don't know what that reason is. That's why I'm a journalist. (laughs) So any final thoughts, Gordon, before we go? No, we have to fight for our country because America is worth fighting for. Gordon, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Jenna. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing smarter.